Hi everybody, how are we doing today? We're back to uh, to discuss some new new things. We've had quite the quite the week. I don't know. Um, <laughs> hi, hi Nishay, what are you what are you doing today? Hey, just uh, yeah, pre- planning to have this call with you guys. How about <laughs> how about you, Dave? Oh, you know, I'm excited to wade into it. It seems like. Uh, as might be expected, speaking to or with, a, in part, an international audience, we've made a mess of political terms. So uh, I think there will be some rich discussion today, for sure. How about you, Brian? Uh, here. <laughs> Present. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, before we get involved with today's topic, which would be the recent piece, uh, that we put out that I authored the uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, uh, Psychedelics and the Right Wing. Um, Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. What? Lucy in the Sky with Nazis. Oh, did I say that? Okay, thank you. Lucy <laughs> in the Sky with Nazis. Um, I thought maybe we could dig into the mailbag because um, the piece did cause quite a stir. So um, we got this uh, via Facebook um, about our previous manufacturing authority said, I tried to listen to your Manufacturing Authority podcast in the hopes that Symposium might shed more light on the emerging and exciting world of psychedelics in the mainstream. I stopped in disgust. (laughs) Have you ever done any psychedelics? Your venom at Goop, Gwyneth, Maps, Austin, what's his name, Ferris, whoever. The entire podcast sounded like the kid who didn't get invited to the party. Get over it. Goops, map, maps, and even shroomery Facebook groups have done more for the cause than Symposia. <laughs> Who is Symposia? What do you do? Anybody want to take that? What do we do? Well, just, I mean, I was chatting a bit about it- this. Before sorry, sorry. I had a, <laughs> Dave got real excited there. No, um, I was talking a bit about this before, but just I'm not sure how much I buy into the intellectual credibility of someone who's going to listen to a podcast titled Manufacturing Authority, thinking that that means it's going to be about uh, an exciting overview of the great ways that mainstreaming have affected the the scene. It just doesn't seem like you know they're necessarily yeah the, on the level that we are speaking to and this is not this podcast is not for everyone we felt the need to create an alternative space alternative dialogues partially so that people who share our perspective don't look at the field and say i don't belong here my ideas aren't welcome here they're welcome here we're creating our own kind of space for people to share like-minded ideas and this is not we're not aiming for the average person to love us. We're aiming for getting across to the people who, you know, are willing to kind of be on our team. So this person's clearly not, not on our team. <laughs> not, not on our team. Um, yeah. And we're also not particularly 101. Um, and I mean, you know, I, I think there's a lot of great outlets that do provide that information, but I mean, it, at the point where we're seeing, you know, long form pieces in the New York times about psychedelics, like I think it's time to start, um, putting out information that's a bit more um, nuanced and in-depth, and I think that's what we try and do. Yeah, I think also, <clears throat> you know, if you're excited about mainstreaming, um, this clearly isn't the podcast for you. But beyond that, like, most of us have been around long enough that that if we wanted to get in on this round of mainstreaming and the rush to... Uh, profiteer off of psychedelics. Uh, we were certainly positioned to do so, um, you know, before all of this broke. I mean, with the information that we put together, I mean, even looking just at the corporate delics, you know, some of us are rather well situated if we wanted to play in speculative markets, and we're not doing that. Uh, additionally, if I were a shroomery member, I might I might take issue, or if I were a more active shroomery member, I might take issue at finding the shroomery put next to Goop and Maps, but you know, uh, (laughs) that's just me. Yeah. Yeah, but just the last point about that, I mean, saying to get over it is not going to do anything. Like we're, we're pretty committed to, to this, to this perspective and some person chiming in from the internet, like you can hate it, but nothing that you're going to say is going to convince us that these are good things that we need to just rally behind. Just 
point yeah. blank. I mean, I don't know, Nishé, I feel like this is part of my process of getting it over, getting over it. Like this, mm-hmm. this whole podcast is me trying to figure out how to get over <laughs> right. what's currently going on in the uh-huh. world with regard to psychedelics. But, um, and one of those things is actually this idea that, um, you know, that psychedelics are going to turn um, us all into shiny, happy people holding hands, um, that we're going to, um, you know, we're going to usher in some kind of uh, ecotopia as a result of uh, the input of, of psychedelics, that um, there's a recent piece out that, um, you know, asks the question, can psychedelics heal the world? And um, so I wrote a piece called Lucy in the Sky with Nazis, um, to provide one of these counterpoints um, to sort of work out some things that I and other people have been observing for a while, which is that, you know, there are a number of um, people on the right wing who seem to like psychedelics just fine and um, have taken them in their past and have still ended up, you know, ex- uh, having very reactionary views. Um, and so I wanted to just sort of create a little space to. Uh, to talk about that. And in general, um, what I was hoping hoping to do with the piece was um, provide several examples, um, sort of broaching or bridging the entire spectrum of what I can tell seems to qualify as right-wing beliefs. So everything from reactionary extremists to sort of right-leaning centrists. And so that was kind of what I was uh, hoping to address. Um, yeah, the response was was various. There was um, quite, um, you know, some people said it was polarizing. And I think that might even be fair, because a lot of people seem to really like it. Um, There's a lot of response that was positive people sending me personal messages and um, that kind of thing. Um, But then there was a lot of people who very much did not like it. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, I don't know. I collaborated with with y'all and talked about my ideas about this um, over over time. How, what what thoughts do y'all have? Well, I feel like and I think we talked about this before, but I feel like there is a an analogy with the internet and the kind of the utopianism around the internet of like, oh hey, there's this great new technology that's going to fundamentally collect connect everyone together, and that's going to lead to progress and democratic. You know, like there's this vision for the future <laughs> that was a connected future, networked future that was really positive in the early days of the internet. That now that we're in. 2019 is you know 2020 um, 2020 yeah. <laughs> 2020 sorry we're you know especially over the last few years i think that the 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 negative effects the the kind of ability for the internet to foment things like genocide and you know all these like backlash you know right wing black backlashes in different countries around the world that that there's a there's definitely a definite analogy between that and the utopianism associated with psychedelics and how psychedelics are in fact not so distant from from certain right-wing interests. And I think to be more specific on what you were saying, I, yeah, maybe the internet, but definitely social media. Yeah. Social yeah, media more, was, more so, was, definitely. was sold as a tool to connect. And yeah. I've, I've mentioned this before, but there's a fantastic MIT article called From Tahir to Trump. Right. And it's really mm-hmm. about the arc mm-hmm. of great. social media, um, how it played a, a role in the Arab Spring mm-hmm. and how that has culminated in recent years into um, supporting Trump, supporting right-wing causes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> which is really totally. fantastic and the, the and at, the, the, mm. at the time at the time early on um the author uh, writes early on um people who questioned um social media early on were really like poo-pooed and mm-hmm. um and 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 viewed as debbie downers or whatever you know mm-hmm. um you know and and now a lot of their um a lot of their concerns have come to fruition mm-hmm. You know, when it's kind of like a big, I mean, there's a lot of support on in in both on both sides now pushing back against social media. There was an interesting article the other day of some of the big right wing funders how there's been a split 
there's been a, a conservative schism in groups who were supporting um, big tech versus groups who are, are, are starting to push back um, on that. So I, I, I think that, I think that, you know, the critiques that we're offering now um, are very valid in the context of some of these other movements that at first have been seen as, um, you know, utopian or whatever. And any sort of voices of dissent or just people who are concerned are pushed out <laughs> because they're not, um, they're not waving, you know, the banner. Um, well, look, having, having already seen the weaponization of data around social media and the internet more broadly, but, but hardcore with regards to social media. Um, and, you know, one of those stunning examples of that is, is Facebook manipulating the news feeds of uh, Australian teenagers, right. In order to, uh, induce emotional states that are more supportive of consumerism, namely depression and, and uh, feelings of disconnectedness and angst, sadness, right? So, so the concerns that I've been voicing over the last whatever year, year and a half dealing with um, the merging of um, psychedelics and, and bioinformatics and predictive AI and all of this, like we, we have a blueprint for some of this. But also as we talk about voices of dissent around technologies that are hailed as universal goods or potential, I mean, since I started Inherent speaking- Inherent goods. Right. And, and since I started speaking in psychedelic spaces, my big thing has been the need for some sort of uh, politically coherent analysis and, and historically grounded analysis of what uh, what is possible, what might be capable um, utilizing psychedelic insight precisely because these things are not inherently this or that. While they may facilitate or catalyze certain insights, you know, if you have the insight on a psychedelic experience that you are connected to nature, you are connected to your fellow human beings, and you rely on a land base to survive, uh, one would hope, one might hope, that that would result in some sort of sense of preserving uh ecosystems, right, contributing to intact and functioning ecosystems, uh, rather than than coming away with uh, an understanding that aligns with, say, the, the El Paso Walmart shooter of, oh, there's not enough resources and consumption rates aren't going down, so we better kill all the brown people. You right, know, this so is, that, this that would is a be moment. the sort of eco-fascist um, response to resource crises. And I mean, one of the things that was the exuberant um, you know, promoters, the psychedelic cheerleaders, I sometimes fliply ref refer to them as, which I, you know, have been uh, at mm -hmm. times. Um, you know, there, there's a, a want to, uh, to believe that psychedelics can, can be the, or even a solution to some of these intractable problems. Um, and, you know, science has been um, really key in mediating a lot of these discussions. So, you know, Carhart Harris et al. at um, Imperial College had uh, produced a paper that um, essentially asserted somewhere in the discussion that um, psychedelics could be used to address authoritarianism um, because as a part of their treatment resistant depression study with psilocybin, they included some questions about how the participants felt about authoritarianism generally uh, prior to their uh, treatment and then again afterwards. And I think you know, I read all of the press that said, hey, you know, maybe psychedelics can um, help cure fascism. Um, the authors spoke directly about authoritarianism, but they also mentioned um, that these, these were particularly timely findings. It being 2008, I didn't really think they were talking about Maoists. So, um, you know, so I, I think the thing is, and not only that, but the press certainly didn't interpret it that way. Um, so this idea was um, was founded on uh, seven respondents. Um, I mean, it was N equals 14, so there were seven controls who did not take psilocybin, um, and these five questions. And so, I mean, I think that's a pretty big claim to be making. Um, and not only that, but that claim then rests on this idea, which is, um, if we have all of these examples, which I enumerated in the article of you know, individuals uh, most recently from the base who are um, 
a neo-Nazi international group getting caught with uh, materials to extract DMT. Um, other folks um, from the, the, the far right um, having experience with psychedelics, the only conclusion we, we can really make is that um, it being a side effect of uh, treatment-resistant depression, um, psilocybin-assisted intervention, that the authors are at least implying that um, you know, fascism and authoritarianism can be dealt with in a medicalized context. Well, and that thesis, you know, didn't come out of seven people. It's an idea that was born out of the counterculture. It's not sure. something yeah. that has just, oh, look at the data. Who would have thought? You know, it's something that was definitely has a le historical legacy and obviously we can see what happened from the 60s there was a lot of enthusiasm a lot of times people new to the field or new to psychedelics do have that enthusiasm excitement that kind of jubilation even at meeting community mm -hmm. and this feeling of purpose and you know some kind of bigger thing that they're a part of and that you know definitely happened a, a bunch in the 60s and then there was this pushback and there's a need to you know, create a more nuanced version of the idea. Not that it can't facilitate those kinds of things, but on the on, conversely, you know, if you have this leader who is, you know, a strong man, and then you feel like you're a part of this person's vision, then you can support that person. So it's just, it, there's a need for nuance that intellectually doesn't always exist as these, you know, Facebook responses um, well, have shown. Absolutely. I think if things were sort of default oriented in those ways, right, there wouldn't be, I, I imagine we wouldn't have felt a need to work on this project or some of the other projects, right? Like, the fact is, uh, for me, you know, um, as frustrated as I am with a lot of what's going on in uh, and around the project of mainstreaming and medicalizing psychedelics, for me, I wouldn't feel such a strong desire to try to make the case for some of these other considerations, narratives, what have you, if I didn't feel that these were important tools that are too important to fall into the hands or become the sole purview of the tech bros and, and crypto guys and mm -hmm. uh, fascists and whoever else, right? Like, mm -hmm. like to me, this does represent a significant catalyst towards uh, inciting recognition of ecological connection, human connection, uh, a whole host of things, you know, just the, how limited our human understanding of the world around us is. And it's like, if these things can be used in ways that orient people towards a more liberatory praxis, I'm all about that, but they're not inherently there. Yeah, Nishay. So and you admit one. that. Yeah just, yeah. yeah, just one thing, because thinking about that, that goop, um, the, the uh, excuse for goop that was on the New York Times editorial. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, well, because that they played this card of like, you know, humility, scientific humility of like all that we don't know. And it becomes an excuse for snake oil and pseudoscience. So that same humility that you're describing that you can access, you know, cultivate as a result of working with psychedelics can lead you to a place of clarity and openness and curiosity, but it can also lead you to this place of, I don't know, so I'm just going to accept everything on equal footing based on my feelings or my thoughts about Gwyneth Paltrow or whatever else. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's a little bit of an intellectually disingenuous component to that sort of openness that was presented in that op-ed, right? Like we can engage in, th this doesn't have to be some abstract question about like scientific positivism or whatever. Like this can be, if we're talking about something like the jade egg, uh, mm -hmm. do we have material observations that support the supposedly scientific or medical claims that are being made about mm -hmm. these products? Yeah. If the answer is no, we can't say, or we can even say, look, mm -hmm. we don't know everything, but based on our observations, mm -hmm. based on these studies, you know, we can't actually find evidence for that. And we can comment on that in a meaningful way. And I think this actually ties into some of the concerns about um, entryism and questionable mm -hmm. characters and like, right, like, oh, this person isn't really a, a fascist or they're not really a Nazi or they're, they're not really, you know, I mean, this is part of why thinking about, about characters like Richard Spencer, who 
uh, I'm not aware of anybody, uh, or I'm not aware of him making statements about using psychedelics, but his name yeah. has been invoked by people uh, around the discussions uh, involving the recent article, where it's like, he coined alt-right in part, you know, he created this movement of suit and tie Nazis in order to get a certain respectable veneer right. so that there could be engagement in these ways where it gives people a plausible deniability or in, in Piper's discussion of blood axis, uh, and maybe I'm getting too far ahead, well, where you I wanna, play the role and then deny quick. it. I want to yeah, back please. up real quick because you mentioned entryism and um, I want to make sure everybody understands what it is. Um, I provided a counter example um, as a way of sort of um, explaining it in the article, but essentially entryism is, um, uh, it's a political strategy where an organism um, is going to encourage its, um, its members to join and show up um, in the communities of other larger um, organizations in an idea, in, a, in an effort to actually infiltrate and recruit. So this is um, an explicit and common strategy on, um, on the right, because the right, just like the Republican Party is um, going around gerrymandering and voter, voter engaging in voter suppression, there is a self-awareness that their ideas are deeply unpopular. Mm -hmm. And so they have to be smuggled into the mainstream. Um, and one of the things that Alan Piper, who wrote, wrote Strange Bedfellows, um, uh, strange drugs make for strange bedfellows. It's a, a, a piece that very much um, inspired me to do some further investigation about um, the current status of psychedelics and um, right-wing extremists. Because um, he he had done such a great job, and I hope uh, to to explore that um, a little bit with him further. Um, but he talked a lot about entryism. And one of the things he talked about was what you were just um, getting to, which was sort of this uh, doomy, esoteric music uh, scene, the, the neo-folk scene, the goth, goth industrial scene over the years in the 90s and, and to this day has had problems with uh, white supremacists showing up and trying to weasel their way into the community. But you what is going to happen when Richard Spencer makes a YouTube video? Is he even on YouTube anymore or is he banned? Um, he was banned from like Facebook or Twitter, I believe. Yeah, He's, but you but can anyways. still find tons of remixes of him getting punched at the inauguration. Party. Anyway, anyways, my, my point is what happens when he just makes a video of saying like talking about LSD? What is the response going to be? That's suddenly going to be a super politica politicized issue where LSD now gets associated with the right with the right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's going to happen in that case? Is, is that just, is that just another exercise of like, so Richard uh, Spencer's including? definitely still on Twitter, by the way. Really? I, th I thought he was banned off of Twitter. No, no, he's not. However, a number of, um, of other folks have been like Milo, uh, well, Milo and it's, and, well, they need to get to that. It, well, but it's worth pointing out. Yeah, they need to get to that, except it's not actually beneficial to their business model, right? And this goes back to some of the discussion of weaponization of data and the way that these platforms are set up in order to monetize uh, eyeballs and clicks and referrals and, you know, really these networks. And this is one of the reasons why things like the intellectual dark web and other hubs of people are worth commenting on and are worth discussing, like, uh, to what extent they provide, whether you want to call it radicalization or, or pathways to whatever sort of ideas, right? Because Twitter and these other platforms, even as they're talking free speech, this is less about free speech, in my opinion, and more about the way that these systems work based on um, AI and algorithms and, and really like getting people to engage with content on the platform. And the reality is that these characters are set up in ways that draw people in and that get engagement with these networks in ways that in the case of say YouTube and monetization may be beneficial to some of these people individually, but also when they're recognizing the importance of these channels for spreading their ideas while getting to pretend that they're underground figures and that they're, you know, that they're oppressed and that they're being persecuted for their beliefs. I mean, it's really important to recognize that a lot of these, these ideas are drenched in blood. There are legacies of the atrocities that have been committed in service to these ideas 
Um, and there's a lot more to say on that, but, but Nishay, please. I just wanted to add in the conversation with entryism, there's this concept known as the Overton window and Vox actually did a really great uh, video on it. Um, it's on YouTube, you can search for it, but the Overton window being the range of policies or ideas that are politically acceptable to the mainstream population. And part of the Nazis in suits you know, and, and, and the respectability of, around these really far right ideas is having the effects and intentionally so of shifting the Overton window such that previously fringe ideas on the right are being intentionally seeded into mainstream kind of acceptability. Yeah. yeah. Uh, w one of the things that Alan Piper talks about when he talks about these subcultures being vulnerable to entry is en entryism is that, you know, the reason why he's talking about it is psychedelics um, have been a fringe uh, subculture for a long time. And there, um, you know, there are instances that one can point to where this, um, this entryism has been employed. So, I mean, we have um, the Atlantic reported um, that the Adam Waffen division um, individuals who had been busted um, for a number of charges, but among, amongst them was um, possession of uh, drugs, including mushrooms. And they, they got uh, their texts where they're talking about whether or not, you know, using drugs was consistent with their um, belief, their their esoteric Nazism beliefs, um, and they they basically said, "Well, uh, I'm not sure, but I've I've got a bunch of mushrooms anyhow." Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, things. I, I guess the 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 thing that um, that strikes me about um, about psychedelics is that they're sort of cognitively mutagenic in the first place. You're always going to be mixing and matching um, ideas, and so when talking about you know, the seemingly at first incongruent um, juxtaposition of um, far right or even just conservative ideas and ideologies with psychedelic use. Um, it may not be a phenomenon that is, um, you know, as frequent as being a, um, I don't know, like a, a libertarian at Burning Man, um, like mm -hmm. it's, it's there and you can, and I wanted to point to it um, to show that like, it, that their psychedelics don't represent some kind of um, silver bullet to right wing ideology. Mm -hmm. um, in, I think in it's crazy in, we're talking about this, like uh, how many, uh, it's been 60 years or whatever since, <laughs> you know, we started like with set and setting, how, how many, well, why? but how many people are like, even why are we that, still like, saying that? I know exactly why we're still saying this. It's crazy. Um, because in talking <laughs> about what I've been doing, writing this piece um, to, you know, randos at the bar, it almost feels a little silly saying, yeah, I'm sort of writing a piece um, about how psychedelics aren't going to take us into utopia. The rest of the world doesn't actually believe this. You know, this is this is a narrative that is within the psychedelic community um, of those who have taken the they've already drank the Kool Aid and they think this is a reaction to this is a reaction to the Control Substances Act. This is a reaction. This is this is the crafting of a new narrative. Well, um, I mean, this for is fun for medicalization and for fundraising. That, <laughs> that, that's yep. really what I think it this is. is this is I, th also I think there's some this... authenticity as well behind it. That's what I was going to say. This is also Agreed. the spilling out of people's wide, you know, slack jawed, open eyed, like, holy shit, I just got my doors blown off. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. I was the universe and the universe was me. And holy shit, I, we're <laughs> all together. Like, you know, and to me, like, this is part of the reason why I would say there's such a need for political mm -hmm. praxis around this, because you know, at its most baseline, if you have an experience that, that we could describe as totally hippy dippy and, and super connected and all there is is love, and then you come back to a world in which you're constantly told you're unlovable in order to push products, right? There is a, you know, multi-trillion dollar advertising uh, industry that's aiming at your head telling you that, that you're alone, you're disconnected, you're unlovable unless you buy the right products. Like that presents a, a political project clearly. And so how do we orient, how do we engage around that? But that takes political and historical analysis and engagement. Nishe? One other thing is I, there's a deeper shared root to 
the, some of the right, the far right today and psychedelic ideas. So it's more, and you, and you get into some of this in, in your article, there's more to it than just there are some far right people who take psychedelics. Yes. And specifically this idea of accelerationism, which is a very like philosophically driving idea on the far right that, you know, this, inst th this idea that the world is speeding up technologically, that we're reaching this new kind of phase and that by... Yeah, uh, you, that you, people can operate to uh, accelerate things further along those lines. So by instigating race war, et cetera. But that basic premise of accelerationism, the idea that things are changing and the status quo is, is no longer going to be tenable is an idea that is very common amongst people who work with psychedelics on the left. So that the, the, the fact that there is this kind of like shadow version of that idea that involves genocide you know but is is structurally very similar i think is is noteworthy and it's part of the reason why psychedelics are actually you know in line with that right tendency yeah well and there's also discussion of like back to the land movements and and right like the the things like connection to nature things like um you know a sense of of awe and reverence for some sort of mythologized past like there's all sorts of things i mean and then if we get into into questions of uh initiatory rights and the hierarchies present there or if we look at things like the manson family and right there because are all there... of these potentials to sort of orient those things in ways where where that mm -hmm. can feed into narratives and the manson uh, precisely family... along those lines the Manson family was like an early version of this accelerationist, you know, race war mentality and it's precisely tied to psychedelics. So I think that that, that history, that legacy has not really been thought through by people working, you know, in the psychedelic space. Well, it, yeah. with regards so, to medicalization, just real quick, medicalization and mainstreaming, like, you know, the thing I keep pointing out is that there's this, this presumption, there's this unacknowledged middle step between giving everybody the drugs or now, you know, under the guise of medicalization, giving everybody the drugs plus therapy and then society getting better. And there's no, you know, <laughs> none of the advocates of this are engaging with any sort of roadmap or loose strategy well, Dave, or it's, even it's, it's sketch naturally of the gonna happen. projects to get there. <laughs> it's well, naturally going to happen, Dave. <laughs> All you have to do is make your bed. So I actually want to talk, talk to one of these efforts that's, that's ongoing in real life right now. Um, MAPS, um, I referred to it in, um, in the article that there is efforts um, in Israel-Palestine to um, to wield ayahuasca as a tool for healing trauma along with um, uh, facilitators who are able to talk through these traumas with both Israeli and Palestinian participants. And so um, I use this as an example as um, one of these um, very transformative uh, uh, applications for psychedelics. And, um, you know, I have no doubt that ayahuasca has healing uh, potential for people with extreme trauma, but um, Natalie Ginsburg wrote something about the piece um, called Can Psychedelics Play a Role in Making Peace and Healing Cycles of Trauma? And I just wanted to read something from her piece, which was a, a quote from one of the participants, a Palestinian man. He explains, I cannot go to a checkpoint and be like, I'm a human being, let me through. I'm a spiritual light being, you know? Even for me, it can be a challenge, which is how can you heal trauma if the trauma is ongoing? Mm -hmm. You can't heal it, but you can bring a shovel and dig some shit out. Every, every once in a while, more shit will come out. But the more you dig out, the more space you create where people are free to see things differently, engage differently, and be creative. Um, and I think, you know, our point, our contention has been that as the psychedelic renaissance unfolds, um, the setting is capitalism. And capitalism is an inherently exploitative system that is turning us all into cogs. Um, you know, the, it's, it eats our time. It monetizes our relationships. How, how, how can, can psychedelics situated um, fully in this um, in this system ever undo uh, such systemic issues that I mean, what's more capitalistic and profitable than war? Psychedelics mm -hmm. are not going to solve that yeah. until well, they address the structural 
uh, issues, you know? And that quote from the Ginsburg article is sort of the odd man out. Like going True. through that article, there was quite a I commend a bit her for of, including it though. Oh, I'm, I'm quite grateful that that was in there because the rest of the piece to me largely read as sort of neoliberal appeals for individual responsibility. And the fact that, you know, before we can address these issues of, of uh, international politics and state relationships, we all have to take responsibility for healing ourselves, which has largely been the maps line around much of this. And like, I disagree. Well, that's with an that. easy that's an easy thing to to do when you're taking the Mercer's money, right? Pre precisely, yeah. or when you're taking Christian Angermeyer's money, right? Or right. when you're taking all of these other people who are invested in systems of global speculative capital, who are invested in various war machines, who are invested in things like Cambridge Analytica and and this sort of data manipulation, you know, like. Uh, it, it's, it's so fascinating. And this comes back to the point that I was making ages ago about Peter Thiel, right? You can't take Thiel money uh, and look at, at it's working with somebody whose vision for society drives all sorts of components of the war machine, of American militarism, of like uh, shredded social safety nets, while also saying our goal is to mitigate as much as possible, if not end um, instances of soldiers dealing with PTSD. It's like yeah. those things are, are incongruent. I want to talk about Teal real quick because he serves as um, a really instructive bridge to something that caught quite a bit of flack um, in the piece. And um, so the, um, the person who is in charge, who's the managing director of Teal Capital, is a mathematician named um, Eric Weinstein. Eric Weinstein is quite popular on YouTube and is, in fact, the person who coined the term the intellectual dark web. So the intellectual dark web is um, allegedly a heterodox um, association of rebel um, thinkers, uh, mostly on YouTube. Uh, it seems their unification is that they've been ex uh, excommunicated from um, polite liberal company for rejecting um, identity politics and SJWs. And a lot of them claim to be, they claim to be um, classical liberals, which I mean, is a ideology that goes back to Locke. Um, Locke certainly wouldn't agree with any uh, of this feminism or intersectionality. Um, so it's actually, when you talk about yourself as a classical liberal, um, it is a rather conservative uh, version of that ideology. Um, so there's some misrepresentation of one's ideological position baked in. And some of that plays into um, the the platform that they're they're often engaging with. I mean, uh, many in the intellectual dark web have podcasts of their own. They um, they go on e uh, on e each other's shows, and um, and as a result, there's this sort of entourage effect of um, reinforcement of each other's. Um, reinforcement and or toleration of each other's ideas. And some of those ideas can be quite extreme to the right. Um, I, I cited several of these individuals um, in the piece um, and I got a lot of flack for calling um, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris and um, Joe Rogan conservative authoritarians. Now, I typically um, think that if you're somebody who strings words together for a living and you have to appease a broad audience, um, it may not be that you're 100% transparent about what your personal beliefs are um, because it's part of your business model to be accessible, right? So I try and watch what people do. And um, I think, you know, it's easy to, to make the case that, say, Jordan Peterson is a conservative authoritarian because, um, well, he goes to Turning Points USA uh, <laughs> conferences and speaks and literally defends, um, you know, all kinds of ideas um, on the sort of uh, hetero patriarchy kind of uh, establishment uh, sort of thing. Um, Sam Harris, I mentioned, um, is someone who has spent a significant amount of time fighting on the internet with um, someone um, with, with Ezra Klein. I included that debate um, about his defense of Charles Murray. Um, Charles Murray, who's a, he's a race scientist who uh, was dealt with by a lot, uh, by no, no one 
no one less than say Stephen Jay Gould, who was an evolutionary biologist, um, you know, who's no longer with us, who engaged with those ideas back then. So, I mean, to me, I don't know, defending um, open racists is not exactly a, a progressive idea. Well, um, I think there's also this point about representation um, that we can tie into, uh, you know, Piper makes the point really well, I think, talking about um, the way Hoffman, uh, Albert Hoffman discusses uh, Carl Schmitt, right? Where, where Hoffman refers to Schmitt as a constitutional lawyer uh, and Piper says, which he was, but doesn't mention that Schmidt was a member of the NSDAP, the Nazi party, mm -hmm. and acted in his role as a constitutional lawyer for the Nazis, providing a legal basis for the regime, right? And it's like, these, the way that, that people portray their contacts, the way that you can sort of uh, tell the truth or present a lie by omission or paint a picture of somebody that is, you know, accurate and defensible, right? Sort of the same way uh, we see certain bands or organizations use various runes or uh, symbolism that ties into legacies of, of white supremacy or white supremacist uh, organizations in ways that allows a certain plausible deniability, right? Mm. If you are not in the know, uh, you wouldn't necessarily recognize the symbols in the first place. Oh yeah, dog uh, whistles. Dog whistles are very, very common on the right. And I want to actually, before anyone accuses me of dancing around one of the you know, main contentions, uh, the pushback that I got, that was that um, in that paragraph, I included uh, Joe Rogan. And so yeah. um, in some ways, I, I, I feel like, you know, there, there is a, a healthy criticism of the piece, which is that um, it was polarizing simply because there was some painting with a broad brush. Um, and, you know, in some, some ways that's necessary when you're trying to cover quite a bit of ground, which I was. Um, but, you know, Rogan is somebody who's been somewhat cagey about what, what, you know, what he really stands for, I guess. I mean, he describes himself as, um, as a libertarian. He's, he's pro-gay marriage. He's, he's obviously pro-drugs. Um, he's anti-war, that kind of stuff. But when it comes to things like racism, um, you know, he, he has some curious defenses of, you know, or I would just say facile defenses of what racism actually is, you know, talking a lot about how uh, people on Twitter being called you know, names about being white people, that that is something that we need to spend some time thinking about. But actually, since I mentioned Twitter, I want to talk about how um, you can know a lot about a person um, by who they themselves, they hold themselves accountable to. And so, um, you know, Joe Rogan doesn't claim to be a journalist. He, um, he says, I, I record conversations with people. Um, I've had people push back, say, well, you know, you're going to have a, a conversation with a thousand people or more. Um, some of them are going to be stinkers. Um, but I think it was really instructive what happened when he had Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, on his um, podcast. And that was that um, he wanted to talk to him about, you know, who got banned from Twitter, for what reasons. And in typical Joe Rogan fashion, um, he didn't challenge this um, CEO of a politically important uh, multi-billion dollar company on really anything of substance. Um, and when he does that with, say, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, with, Greg, uh, with Gavin McGinnis, uh, leader of the violent right wing uh, Proud Boy gang, gang people go, um, well, that's, you know, that's just Joe Rogan. He's, um, he's a pretty chill dude. Um, but when he failed to push back against Jack Dorsey about conservatives being banned from Twitter, um, that particular video got about, uh, as of today, uh, 14,000 likes and 86,000 dislikes. And as a result, Joe Rogan had Jack Dorsey back on and had another um, individual to, who apparently can uh, speak better than Jack Dorsey um, to speak on behalf of Twitter and also had a conservative um, YouTuber named Tim Pool on to hammer these two individuals about banning people for um, intentionally and targetedly misgendering people um, for all of the people that were on the conservative sides that were 
banned, they would say, um, for their ideology, but many of the, the examples that we're talking about are people like Sargon of Akkad, um, who was banned for you know, using racist slurs at individuals. Milo Yiannopoulos was banned for uh, targeting an actress in the new uh, all gender swapped um, Ghostbusters, calling her ugly and um, sending his Twitter mob along with. And so these are the people who Joe Rogan chose to be accountable to. They're his audience. So in terms of Joe Rogan's personal beliefs, I mean, he does seem to be a libertarian. It is possible to be a right-leaning libertarian. People are complicated. Um, Joe Rogan recently uh, endorsed Bernie Sanders. Um, I view that cynically. I view that harshly. Like Joe Rogan is a celebrated character. I don't particularly enjoy um, his politics. Um, I have definitely enjoyed some of his interviews, but I guess what I'm saying is, is that sometimes we need to be sharply critical of people who've done um, things that have quite a bit of consequence, particularly when they have a lot of influence, um, and, like the biggest podcaster um, in, in the United States. Yeah, and let's be clear, we're talking about this because Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, and... Uh, Sam Harris are a vector of psychedelics to a huge audience of young people, specifically young men. They are a vector. And that is all what's packaged with that is an introduction, a packaging of all these of all these right wing ideas. You know, mm -hmm. um, Joe Rogan forms ideas for millions of young men. He and forms he's, those he's got ideas. That worships him. And I briefly, I just want to say that um, we talked, um, I think in the last podcast, I'm not sure, one of the podcasts recently, that there's studies that have shown that psychedelics can make you a little gullible. And to me, it's just, it's concerning that somebody, um, somebody's first, you know, exposure to mushrooms or DMT is uh, somebody who's also exposing them to Stefan Molyneux, who's a eugenicist. Um, you know, to Steven Crowder, who sells merchandise that says social, socialism is for fags. Um, you know, the, these individuals, every single time they go on Joe Rogan's show, there's a huge bump in, in their viewership, you know. So um, I'm an ecologist. Um, you can't do one thing in life. You always do many things. Yeah, I think something with Rogan. I, I I think he's I think he's interested. He's super interested in like sure. you and know smart. this is no no what I what I'm saying. He's super interested. I think in that craziness. Um, you know, I think that's evidenced by him having Alex Jones on. He has a long history with Alex Jones going back. He's been on Infowars before. I think he. I think Rogan is like, who the fuck is this guy? And I think he's willing to go he's willing to go there. You know, he's been to the InfoWars studio going way back. And those videos are really interesting to watch. However, my critique about him really comes from the platforming of these people to young, to young kids, you yeah. know? Along the lines of that, I mean, <clears throat> for people who discover more about psychedelics through Rogan, where they're, you know, it's like, mainstream society has been hiding this thing that's crazy and cool and if you if you start thinking like oh rogan is giving me these kinds of you know things that the mainstream has been hiding from me and then you get into these ideas about race and you know everything else it's easier Conspiracy to slip theories. yeah it's easier to slip those in you know you're kind of primed to be feeling like you're being let in on the secret mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, and I mean, and, I want to be fair and say that, um, you know, Joe Rogan's uh, uh, had had this criticism before, you know, he's a businessman who's adapting. Um, and, you know, he's had Abby Miller on, um, who's on the left, who also is sort of a, a notable for being into 9-11 conspiracies and such. Jimmy Dore um, also is on the left, also into conspiracies. Um, and, and, you know, recently he did endorse Bernie Sanders, but I, I view that a bit more like somebody um, who's savvy um, watching which way the winds are blowing. 
Um, if you have a platform that has billions of billions of people, I just don't understand why of all the interesting people in the world, you have fucking losers like Milo on your show. I don't get it. And it's the same way that Jeremy's when, you know, another, another person we, we kind of forget about here a little bit is uh, Bill Maher. Yeah. And, you know, when Bill Maher had people like Milo on, Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept left. You yeah. know, he wasn't going to participate mm-hmm. in in a, in, in a yeah. panel that has someone like that and on. And Jeremy Scahill is a principled journalist who's, who talks about, you know, war and, and um, torture and human rights and um, has a long history with Democracy Now! and other, other you know, but these are people who, um, who own their beliefs and they're, they're honest and, and open about them and they try and be held accountable um, to people who, um, you know, they serve. And I, I guess the question that I have, because a lot of people push back and said, how can you know what is in another person's heart? Mm-hmm. You know, and, I, and it's like, well, I mean, look, I don't know if anybody out there hasn't realized this, but sometimes people lie. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people misrepresent themselves. And then, you know, sometimes people misrepresent themselves, you know, unintentionally. They're, it's like the, the, but I can't be racist, but I have black friends kind of thing. You know, sometimes people are not even aware that they're using the wrong labels to describe their own beliefs and actions. Um, and, but in, yeah, go on. And just one more point on Rogan. Like, one thing people don't like, don't think about too often is that a there's a massive audience for these right wing ideas out there. It's huge, it's gigantic, it's huge. And point number two is Rogan is making tens of thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, per episode i I actually have no idea how much he's making but it's a lot per episode um and these are all being monetized sure so So it's not just having conversations it's at the end of the day it is about making money as well and selling products and and selling supplements and 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 all of that to an audience and if you're a business person dislikes is still a cha-ching yeah, I have totally. a feeling that we probably need to um, spend a little bit more time on another another piece or another episode on the intellectual dark web in particular, because there's a lot going on there. So much of it is sharing the kinds of media that we're currently producing right now. I heard it um, a little while ago said that, you know, Sam Harris, you know, he's a neuroscientist, but he's a neuroscientist that is practically unknown in academia because he spends most of his time producing you know, podcasts and YouTubes, and he's not, he's not currently publishing really anything. Um, sometimes he, I think a while back, he was bothering Noam Chomsky and such, but. But that doesn't um, really, I mean, that's like yeah. a, I mean, academia today, as we know, is like crap. So yeah. true. Some people, <laughs> I, some people like us, agree. like we're, agree. we're here on this podcast rather than <laughs> yes. writing a paper right now. So but I, I guess what I'm saying he's not active, you know? Um, well, and there's also the, the fact that somebody has expertise or, or perceived uh, authority in a, in a particular field um isn't enough on its own to my mind right like the question is what are they saying right there's a a, a, i couldn't for the life of me tell you which jordan peterson clip it is but where he basically puts himself in alignment with a whole bunch of uh psychologists psychiatrists from the 60s saying the job of of psychiatry is really to manage people and get them in line with dominant culture oh yeah like the purpose of psychiatry is is sort of individual management in service to the production and replication that's, of dominant culture. Which... That's even enshrined in the World Health Organization definition of health, which is not mm-hmm. just being the absence of disease, but are you productively contributing to society? Like that Precisely. Is... And this, honestly, I think this goes back to the, to the uh, sort of mailbag that we opened with, which is to say, no, we're not here to perpetuate mainstreaming of really much of anything, right? We're right. here to offer what we feel to be cogent, necessary critiques of some of the stuff that's unfolding and And some of that necessitates pulling together um, a lot of you know um, examples of people's uh, behavior and actions that they themselves or their audience may not be aware of and you know when you do this in journalism um, this is often called a hit piece Um, I think that's wrong I think you know because I had some people regarding the the Paul Austin BBC story where sure. where austin snuck uh you know uh, hid institutional lied, from lied a to a journalist <laughs> yes um you know people so i had a couple people who said look i'm not a fan of, of the hit piece genre but that was phenomenal like 
that's not a hit piece. That's muckraking. That's exposing, yeah. you know, a hit piece by definition uh, is an attempt to take someone down, usually using um, fallacious arguments presented right. as truths. Right. Um, so I think it's worth, you know, as we engage in some of this muckraking or exposure or trying to stitch together the facts, I'm totally open to talking about hit pieces, but let's be very clear about what we're doing as mm -hmm. far as trying to run exposés or, or sort of reveal some of the dynamics here. And mm -hmm. in some cases, we're working against people who are being quite disingenuous about what's going on, right? Like coming back to Richard Spencer for a moment, like this is somebody who talks about the creation of a, a white ethno state, right? Who, who talks about genocide without saying genocide, who talks about creating a white ethno state without acknowledging what it would take to get there, the sort of uh, uh, horrific actions and, you know, comes into communities of color and, and he complains when he gets forced out by uh, right. anti-fascists or other activists. And it's like, at the point where you come into somebody's community loudly espousing uh, ideas that are literally life-threatening. Yeah, they're existential people. threats to their, their ability to continue. You, know, yeah, but, you but, don't get to complain that they force you out. Yeah, go ahead. But I mean, part of why I have followed, you know, Jordan Peterson, listened to his talks and listened to people on Joe Rogan is that that idea can be taken to an extreme, you know, where you suddenly say, oh, I'm a protected class. And so anything that I individually disagree with, I'm going to say is a threat to my existence. And I'm going to use that as a basis for shutting people down. And that does happen. So we need to, I mean, I just want to stress that th this is a nuanced th thing. Absolutely. That there are situations yeah. where that is abused to make it seem like the person. Is I 100% agree. And I, I, I want to say, I want to um, sort of refocus a little bit um, on the the process um, of this radicalization that is unfolding, a lot of it is happening um, on the internet because that is how we're having conversations. And you know, one of the um, one of the examples I used in the piece was the the founder of 8chan um, was somebody who um, he thought up this idea for this sort of free speech absolutist platform um, that was going to be you know even more free. Um, than uh, 4chan, and um, as a result, it was you know quickly taken over um, by a bunch of Nazis. Um, his name was Frederick Brennan, and um, he later really regretted creating this you know cesspool that um, ended up having you know the manifestos of um, three different mass shooters, including the mass shooter at Christchurch who left 51 dead and 50 more injured. Um, one of the things that, you know, that I want to bring us back to a little bit is that this radicalization that's happening on the right um, online is, is being facilitated by these networks. And so we get pushback whenever we try and pin it on one person. Like, oh, it's, it's Joe Rogan over here. Oh, it's Jordan Peterson over here. But it's, it's um, an emergent phenomenon that's happening um, through these associations that are driven by the algorithms that we're seeing um, in YouTube and Twitter, where you um, sort of get ushered along into more extreme content. So um, there's a researcher named Becca Lewis, um, who she's a PhD candidate, and she wrote a data and society um, report that I linked to in the piece that um, you know, has actually been addressed and talked about um, by no, no less of uh, an intellectual dark webber than Eric Weinstein. Um, and he, you know, dismisses it out of hand, he tears it to shreds. But I really would encourage people to read it because the arguments are, um, you know, very easy for understanding how somebody can make, um, make a name for themselves on these platforms, particularly the wielding of strategic controversy um, to draw um, eyes. It's, an, it's one of the oldest tricks in the book. There's no such thing as bad press, um, particularly if you're, you're kind of scrappy and you like to um, kick up some, some dust. But um, also with regard to the reaction to this piece, um, one of these tools that um, these political influencers, Becca draws, uh, uh, Becca Lewis draws a parallel between um, Instagram, Instagram product influencers um, to political influencers who 
um, in the process of building their podcasts, they build rapport with their audiences, they share um, different, you know, personal um, traits or uh, happenings going on in their lives. They build this rapport, even though it's somewhat one sided. Um, and as a result, when these people are criticized for doing things, um, their audience responds like you have attacked their best friend. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a, a tiny little taste of that recently. So it was really instructive to see that somebody had already done that work, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think, I think, I think we get lost a little bit when we describe a, a lot of these people as, you know, members of the intellectual dark web. I think kind of seen more collect, uh, correctly, it's a reactionary movement. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that the, the that these follow uh, throughout history, these follow periods of progress. Um, I think it's a lot less confusing when kind of seen in that light. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's interesting to see, you know, um, people's fellow travelers. I mean, like this is often, you know, been called like some sort of guilt by association fallacy, but I don't know, as somebody who, um, you know, <laughs> We, going back to our hate mail earlier, like I actually have been invited to a lot of parties and I, I've thrown a lot of parties and um, the kinds of parties that I like to throw and I like to attend are those where people feel welcome. And if somebody is particularly causing problems um, to individuals or whole groups of individuals um, at parties that I attend or throw, those individuals are not invited back. And I think that's kind of the issue that I take with some of these people is that there is um, an abdication of any responsibility of editorial um, uh, you know, action, editorial control over, over what they, I mean, Joe Rogan won't even admit that he's, he's a, a journalist um, or that he should have any responsibility for the, the effects of, of his followers, you know, and, um, you know, Peterson, I don't think Joe Rogan is a journalist. Well, well, but that's fine. I think the point to make there, I is think he's the world's most popular. Reached, yes. Right. Like the, the issue, and this is, this is the same thing. This is the reason why, you know, usually when I'm talking about, uh, issues of, of race, I'm not talking about racism. I'm talking about white supremacy, right? right. Like, because we lose in a lot of these, in a lot of the pushback from whether it's folks on the, the IDW or, or other, uh, you know, so-called uh, underground or, or whatever uh, channels that are, are trying to uh, amplify some of this reactivity and, and uh, pushback against whether you want to call it progress or, you know, whatever sort of libertary, liberatory efforts. Um, there's a willful ignorance of power dynamics, right? There's a lack of consideration around questions of coercion, of hierarchy, of structural and systemic inequality, right? When people talk about capitalism, many of these folks are unwilling to seed or, or engage with the fact that the starting capital for capitalism, uh, particularly in the American context, was secured through slavery and genocide. Sure. And you can't get away from that, right? As much as you can say, oh, that was X number of years ago, mm -hmm. like everything since then has followed that and those dynamics still ripple through. And there's no... Oh, go on, Nisha. I was going to say, if anyone's been following the Weinstein trial, like that's like the 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 angle that they're going for is that these women just wanted to capitalize on the celebrity of Weinstein and they knew what they were getting involved with. And they, you know, it's completely avoiding all of these kind of facts about power imbalances and coercion. And, you know, but a lot of people do think that way. Patriarchy. In this that this I mean, being a this different is... Weinstein, just so that we're clear. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, but that's why I think it's so important to name those systems in ways that encapsulate the power dynamics and in ways that tie them to historical and systemic 
uh, oppression and allow for critique of those structures, not just in the abstract of, of racism as this idea of, you know, lumping people together, treating them in this way, this, that, and the other, that there needs to be an acknowledgement of the really existing structures and power dynamics that play out because otherwise we're missing a huge piece of it. And instead we're talking in abstractions and that allows yeah. for the creation of all sorts of straw man arguments that, that really, I think, get away from the lived realities of folks who, for example, when, when Joe Rogan platforms people who are able to amplify harmful ideologies, that ripples out in the real world, you know, yes, uh, it does. as, as a Jew seeing the increased uh, numbers of, of targetings against, you know, Jewish targets, whether we're talking cemeteries or, or actual people in the case of like synagogue shootings, mm -hmm. like seeing the rhetoric that has ratcheted up under Trump and the way that that has created an umbrella, um, you know, again, coming back to the Overton window. And I think that I'll be, I'll be straight up. And I have been in the past, like a lot of my uh, rhetoric in psychedelic spaces has been the reason I try to hold down, you know, the most coherent, radical position that I can articulate is precisely because I want to stretch the Overton window in the other sure. direction. Not because yeah. I expect everyone to meet me there, yeah. but right. because I think this all show the is about counter missing out on. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the counter narrative, one of the counter narratives that we are um, going to continue to engage with is that this, this capitalist system out that, that is going to be the home of all of these medical or retreat. I mean, there's currently hundreds of retreat centers um, all over the world that are engaging with only the richest clients, um, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, the piece that, the, the Lucy in the Sky with Nazis piece, you know, it ended with discussions of um, capital and capitalists and billionaires because there's no Plutocrats. such thing plutocrats. Um, there's no such thing as like a left-wing billionaire. It's a contradiction in terms. And so I wanted to take it um, from the extremes um, to the most mainstream and celebrated of, of, of capitalist um, society, you know, individuals like Elon Musk uh, and other, other billionaires who are, are playing in this space. And in some, in some cases, are, are laundering, you know, their reputations with this. And we talked about um, Tim Ferriss uh, the, the other day. And, you know, Tim Ferriss said that, um, you know, all of the billionaires I know without, without, almost without exception, use hallucinogens on a regular basis. Um, they're, uh, they're trying to be very disruptive and look at the problems in the world and ask completely new questions. Now, one of the questions that none of these billionaires seem to be asking is, should there still be billionaires, despite the mm -hmm. fact that they've been, you know, presumably um, had access to just about any, any substance their hearts can desire? When there's that, I, I can't pronounce his last name now, but Anand G something, he writes, he wrote um, the a Winners Take All is the book, and he's done tons of great talks that are on youtube mm -hmm. um but he talks about you know the the disruptors at the top you know at places like davos or um the aspen institute where they they're disruptive to a point and then you know they're they're using the language of liberation and progress but ultimately there's a line for them where they don't want to talk about restructuring society. They don't want to talk about taxation. They want to keep control with their philanthropic models. And for him, he says, you know, a lot of us have drank, drunk the Kool-Aid of this plutocrat ideology that is, is sustaining this ridiculous system that only benefits mm -hmm. a few people. And part of, you know, the, the potential at least for psychedelics is to help wake people up to you are, you know, making assumptions about, the insufficiency, you know, the, the, the ridiculous, uh, uh, in, what's the word for when something doesn't work? The, like the government can't be. Untenability. Well, it's, it's like, it's like that the government can never do anything, you know, forget it's underfunded, forget whatever the government will never be competent. The incompetency. In, inept. Yeah, inept, inept, yeah. Inept. Yeah. So the government's inept. You have to have these billionaire plutocrats to be. John Galtz. You know, choosing 
what to invest in, that they're the ones that are going to save us. So that is a crazy story that's been dreamed up. I mean, when, well, when, 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 when the so-called disruptors openly identify as free market anarcho-capitalists, <laughs> I think we're kind of lost. Oh my in, God. But we're lost the, in the they, And they the tell the, the whole story on the internet that was, uh, you know, something that was invented by the Pentagon in the first place. Like it's... Well, and the fact that we're in, we're, we're, we have such political incoherence that somebody can, can assert uh, that they're an anarcho-capitalist in a room and, and the room doesn't immediately erupt into laughter, right? Sure. Like the fact that these people are, again, intellectually dishonest about the fact that they're calling for control by unaccountable tyrannies. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're talking about corporations, the way that these things are set up, we're talking about a system of fiefdoms, you know, yeah. corporate controlled fiefdoms. And the privatization we've seen in the US, you know, in our lifetimes and all of our lifetimes, you know, this has been, we didn't even, we, <laughs> we didn't catch the beginning of stagnation. We've just caught all of the, the fallout from that. And yeah. one, one thing Anand talks about is, you know, in every period of history when there were like kings or whatever, there were the court intellectuals who, you know, would say things like, you know, oh, the inevitability or like, this is the way that the world needs to be. This is the kings. end of history. This is, well, when this is like, this is the, the perfect way to have society. You know, there's, yeah. there's no better way. And that's going on today with these plutocrats that people are, there's the court intellectuals who who naturalize as inevitable the system that we have now. Yeah. Maybe, and oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and as we're talking about issues of, of uh, Nazis and, and the far right and questions of class, you know, it's worth looking at the U S uh, as the breeding ground of white supremacy, as the, the creation of, you know, when you had all of these colonial projects, right. That ultimately were faced with this question of, what do we do? We've got tons of slaves and indentured servants and, you know, people who have every economic incentive to, uh, to, to form affinity with indigenous peoples who are being forced off of their lands. How do we come up with a system to deny that sort of class solidarity and consciousness? Mm -hmm. And you see the creation of race laws. You see this carrot and a stick, whereas uh, the new creation of, of white folks you know, suddenly they're being given the ability to own land, that, mm -hmm. that if they intermarry, they're going to lose their, their privilege as white folks. And suddenly you're able to create this huge wedge into class solidarity. And I think there's a really important, there are a number of really important points. And I think, you know, Bernie has tapped some of that. And I think yeah. uh, this is coming up in important ways. But, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the and, and again, I think it's one of the reasons why it's really important to stay focused on the, the power balances around issues of, of race and white supremacy and all of these different things, because the intersectionality of these different issues uh, can't be understated. Sorry. Go yeah, ahead, Dave. So I just wanted to um, sort of elaborate on a point that you made, which is, um, you know, Haiti is the only um, formerly enslaved colony that, that successfully threw off um, its colonizers. And it's been, you know, impoverished and had to pay back um, the debt of freeing themselves to France and the international community mm -hmm. for through one way or another. Um, you know, ever since. And these, these laws that you're talking about um, at various periods, the Haitian Revolution is just a, a, a fascinating, um, you know, period, but there were the imposition of these laws on free people and then the pushback um, to it. And it was um, an example of some of the things that you're talking about. Um, totally. Yeah, and well, when you have slaves being like forced to former slaves to pay reparations to the white slave owners, but right. never in the other direction, you know, there's a problem. Right. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that, you know, um, ideology is something that's shifting. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's hard to attempt to categorize people who, you know, claim to be uncategorizable. Um, you know, Alan Piper, who I hope we will speak to at some point in the future about his excellent work, um, you know, had expressed some of the difficulty of categorizing a man like Junger, who lived to be a hundred, you know, and, um, you know, there's this quote by, um, 
by Robert Anton Wilson, who himself, you know, was an advocate for uh, pretty, you know, 19, 1970s libertarianism. He said, you know, a person can uh, go from a liberal, uh, or it takes 20 years uh, for a liberal to become a conservative without changing a single idea. And I mean, as, as these, uh, you know, as we sort of allow other um, share the share the stage with with folks who you know are telling a different side of story like yeah times times change how we we see things yeah i don't think it's 20 years though uh, yeah well, not, not I, anymore it's just, and, it's and a in few that, in that context you know i also want to uh we started with a little fan mail uh <laughs> i'd like to to end with a little bit more just because i think that point about the ideological spectrum or orientations, um, there's some stuff worth saying. So this was was a comment from uh, Julian Palmer, who fashions himself the uh, inventor of changa, although, you know, uh, <laughs> that's hotly contested, seeing as we have evidence of uh, DMT and beta carboline combinations going is, back thousands of it years. Is, it is circulated though, like not just him who says this. So just No, just yes, that. there like are other people a... who, who believe it and who uh, articulate it. And there's evidence on internet forums from the late 90s, early aughts that that's not the case. And again, we have archeological evidence that, that clearly depicts that's not the case in my opinion. But Julian says towards uh, Brian Pace, People like you are, Brian, are creating this enemy through polarity, therefore creating hatred, and you think that it is justified because of their views. Actually, you are a bigot, the very definition of a bigot. You might want to look up that word. Thanks for putting me onto the debate with Richard Spencer. This guy is copying so much hatred from people who don't even understand his views. His views are fairly cogent, so thanks for putting me on to alternative influence. By the way, funded by the New York Times and Microsoft. What the fuck? I bet you haven't even watched the debate they mention or understand Richard Spencer's views. That is why my initial comments stand. You are simply maintaining division and difference, choosing to completely separate yourself and heap scorn onto people who have different ideas than you. I don't actually agree with Richard Spencer regarding his ideal view of the world, and I don't think many people are keen to get onto his bandwagon, but I certainly don't think he is as evil as Joe Biden, for example. Funny how I bought into this irrational boogeyman theory about Spencer, which is just ignorant, not knowing his views, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's be clear. Joe Biden's history of corruption as far as engagement with the, the credit industry and a variety of other things is undeniable, despite uh, Bernie distancing himself from uh, uh, Zephyr Teachout's recent op-ed. Um, that being said, uh, and that's worth looking into. <laughs> I won't go down that rabbit hole at the moment. Um, but despite Biden's demonstrable corruption, uh, I think you would be hard pressed to make the case that he is more evil than Spencer, as Spencer calls for a white ethno state um, engaged in major organizing, say, around the Unite the Right rally that led to Heather Heyer's murder. Um, we can point to numerous concrete examples, and I'll tell you, uh, with all the issues I have with Joe Biden, you know, as a Jew, I can tell you unequivocally, I feel a hell of a lot less safe about and around the ideologies that Richard Spencer is articulating and putting out into the world. This notion that if you speak back or speak out against somebody who is presenting an existentially threatening ideology towards you, your friends, your family, your loved ones, um, that that is somehow sowing divisiveness. Mm -hmm. You're the that real that, bigot. That yeah. is the real bigotry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, that just doesn't fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I guess um, strange thanks to uh, Julian Palmer for uh, providing us uh, an example of the kinds of things that I was writing about in Lucy in the Sky with Nazis <laughs> out there in the wild. Um, right. Proof of concept, right? Pretty <laughs> fucking weird out there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I appreciate um, you know the chance to to talk a little bit more because it seemed like there was you know quite a bit of confusion about what you know was trying to be asserted. I think one of the things that I learned um, in writing this piece is that um, just because I included hyperlinks that back up some of the things that I'm asserting doesn't mean that people ever click them. So, um, <laughs> Look, it's an emotional thanks. response. It's been a learning experience. It, yeah. It's an emo this is an, it's Welcome an, to the club. <laughs> it's an emotional response to, um, to people that <clears throat> um, people listen to every day.
Yeah. You know, they like them. You know? And, you know, and people are complicated and, you know, like, I, I don't know everything. Like, I, I certainly um, am wrong all the time. So if people disagree with me, I'm okay with that. Um, but the, the funny pushback that, that this piece got, um, in particular, for talking about three individuals um, who, are, who themselves and are a part of a larger, in, um, you know, association called the Intellectual Dark Web that seems incredibly angry um, about anyone attempting to silence anybody's but, outrageous speech seem to be um, but, particularly upset that I may have mischaracterized their favorite podcast. <laughs> but let's be clear here. There is a strategic concerted effort amongst psychedelic advocates to appeal to conservatives and the far right. That is, an un- that, that is an undeniable fact. Mm-hmm. That's the strategy right now. So yeah. we can argue yeah. about who's conservative and who's not. To mainstream psychedelic medicalization, there is a concerted effort to create bipartisan support on this is something that Rick Doblin has been doing. And Rick is on the record asking what's more mainstream than police officers, what's more mainstream than military veterans. And I look, stand by my assertion that the communities that they are deployed against are more mainstream than either category. And, you know, by numbers, by uh, uh, social uh, engagement, by, you know, whatever you want to, whatever metric you want to use, this notion of creating some sort of holistic uh, cross divide uh, engagement here glosses over so many of precisely the sorts of power dynamics and and hierarchies and coercive relationships that that I was speaking to earlier. Yeah, Brian, finish your thought. You were you were saying something. This is a strategy, and 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 a lot of people aren't aware of of the strategy this is under the guise of building bipartisan support for psychedelic medicalization um rick and others have been very vocal about um they've they've done victory laps and and they've and 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 they've told tons of people like yes our goal was to get into breitbart i think seen correctly bright breitbart <laughs> Breitbart is like some pre-Nazi um, magazine. Oh like, yeah, I mean, BuzzFeed Breitbart did a great is. story on on white supremacist um, emails with Milo Yiannopoulos going back and forth between um, Breitbart uh, editors. It's you know, despite the fact that Ben Shapiro was there and um, claims that he can't be alt right because he's a Jew, like um, it's Breitbart much more, is yeah. a white supremacist outlet. Like that's, that's one, controversial. that's one example. Maps is also meeting with Matt. They, they, my understanding, I was told by someone, um, in the organization, they have met with Ted Cruz. They have met with Rand Paul. They have met with Trump. They have met with Jeb Bush, um, in an effort to build bipartisan support for psychedelic medicalization. Um, Maps has accepted Mercer money. I, I created a quick timeline. We can get into this in a, in a, in a, in a future episode. But um, it's really interesting about Rebecca, Rebecca Mercer. The Mercers have funded right-wing um, think tanks, uh, Breitbart, the ally of Bannon. Um, they distanced themselves with Bannon after he got in the White House. They've distanced themselves with Trump after he got in the White House. But they were... Um, you know, they funded him quite a lot in, in the run uh, in 2016. Um, Rebecca Mercer is someone who in uh, New York Tam- Times ran a piece in on January 25th um, of 2018 called A Science Denier at the Natural History Museum, Scientists Rebel. Um, and it, over, 200, um, over 200 scientists and academics at the time um, you know, they said that they don't want Mercer here. Um, we need to end ties to anti-science propagandists and friends of, um, of climate science misinformation. Yeah. That was on January 25th of 2018. Well, and this is on what's... February 14th of oh, 2018. No. Oh. Maps came out with a press release oh, um, saying that they were going that they're going to be accepting one million dollars from a Rebecca Mercer. Um, 
And Rick Doblin's quote was, with this gift, the Mercers are at the forefront of scientifically rigorous medical innovation. This is less than one month after the, uh, the Natural History Museum, um, you know, came out saying, you know, uh, challenging, um, you know, her views on science. And you have Rick Doblin, several weeks later, laundering her scientific cred. Um, and then, of course, it was uh, a, a couple weeks after that, that um, all the news broke about Mercer's and Cambridge Analytica. So this is very real. It's not like we're out there picking fights with Jordan Peterson and, and, and Rogan and Sam Harris and other reactionaries. This is very real, um, where there's a concerted effort, a strategic effort, um, you know, to to work with these people. And Rick Doblin has defended this by saying um, that accepting, um, accepting this money is an effort to build bipartisan support. And in figures like Teal, he said that um, my problem with Teal is that he doesn't donate to MAPS. That's his problem with Teal. Um, so, you know, this is fair game for, for critique. And this is something that I think that the community should talk more about that by and large has been relegated to Facebook comments and um, conversations, um, kind of uh, private conversations amongst people. And yeah, I think, the, I think the critique is fair game. If this is, if this is the strategy that the movement is taking, um, we're not the ones to go after about talking about <laughs> right wing influence in psychedelics because it's very real and it's very out there in your face. Yeah, I just wanted to add that something that came up earlier that there are some really advanced long game strategizers on the right with things like entryism with things like shifting the Overton window. And we saw what happened with reality sandwich once they started working with capitalists and then got out capitalist by you know the people they were working with it's like maps can say they have this strategy but they're working with like the ultimate strategizers and they can't act like they have the upper hand and the other thing is like we need to as dave was saying be concerted strategizers in the other direction lest we you know, allow things like Mitch McConnell taking over the Senate, because that's what happens if one, you know, party is working really hard to stack things in their favor over time. Totally. Well, and in the case of, um, you know, you just made the point, um, in the case of some of these longer term strategies or the openness to, to even discuss them, you know, I found it really interesting when I was discussing Mercer money on public platforms, uh, I proposed the idea of considering that it was a million dollars over four years. What if maps offered uh, a counter fundraiser, right? Where they said, Oh, the Mercers are offering us a million dollars over four years. We're going to do a fuck the fash <laughs> fundraiser where, you know, we're looking for matching donations, uh, 250,000 a year. What can we raise? Here's our goal. Let's, let's get it. And all of the feedback or the most, the most vehement feedback that I got about it was not about the concept was not questioning whether it was wrong to take Mercer money or what have you, or whether or not the community could engage in equivalent funding. It was an issue that I had decided to float the name, fuck the fash. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> nobody who thing. engaged, yeah, nobody yeah. who engaged in the argument or discussion was, <laughs> that's, was willing that's... to say that's a placeholder. <laughs> and, and I said, look, everybody who's chimed in on this thread has said, has, has taken issue with the title. Mm -hmm. So does that mean if we change the title, y'all think that this is a fine strategy? And a there lot was no of problem. people confuse politics with aesthetics. Yep. And unfortunately, that's something that we have to deal with. Um, but it's true. And I mean, I, I think the idea is wonderful. I mean, you know, if, if this, if that, if that, you know, were something that would actually have landed considering the, the, the priors in this situation. But well, um, and as Normie pointed out, when the strategy is a bipartisan approach, so called, you know, when it is this component of mainstreaming, you know, I, I get why people in those institutions aren't involved. And to Nishay's point about uh, Reality Sandwich becoming, you know, getting out capitalized by the capitalists, you know, yeah. um, this is the thing. MAPS has historically been 
the monolith or the megalith on the hill. They are the major, uh, the best funded, they have been historically the best funded institution in the space by a long shot. It hasn't even been close. Yeah, Except especially that now, with years. the encroachment of all of these corporadelic actors, venture capitalist-backed outfits, MAPS is about to be a drop in the bucket. MAPS is about to be a tiny, tiny fish in a very big pond. Well, so one of the things that I sort of wrapped up that piece with was um, essentially something that, you know, after spending some time saying that, look, you know, psychedelics, like they're not necessarily going to push you in one way or the other. That's m much more going to be informed by your priors, by the setting um, that you're in, um, your expectations, what have you. Um, I sort of end up arguing for the the idea that, you know, if we believe that um, there are certain ideals that are worth fighting for, then we should fight for them. We should own them. We should not externalize them on something else. Um, and I think that, you know, we can, we can see that, that MAPS has perhaps a different model of change. Um, but it's more of the appeal to the center, you know, sure. um, but I mean, you know, it, 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 I just want to finish this real quick because, you know, Becca Lewis argues something similar in um, her data and society uh, report where she says like, you know, when YouTube says I'm going to stay out of it and be a neutral um, arbiter of, you know, all kinds of speech, except for some of the most egregious cases, um, they really select for this extreme content. And um, she ultimately argues that like, you know, maybe they should actually state some ethics and fight for them. And I think that um, that's something I can get behind, um, at least in my own life um, and with people I like to work with. Um, sorry, what was, was there anything else that, that y'all wanted to say? Okay. I'm happy to leave it there. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a, this was a convoluted one, but um, thanks for coming along uh, with me on the ride. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. That's a wrap, I guess. <laughs>